Hi everyone. My name is Marissa Sanjacomo, and on behalf of St. Martin's Press, Henry Hull, and FSG, I am thrilled to welcome you to our celebration of Jane Austen virtual event. As the title suggests, today's event is a celebration of an iconic author, what she means to us and what it means to read, reflect, and now more than ever recharge with Austen and Austen inspired works. Each of the authors you'll hear from today represents how Austen's legacy can be endlessly interpreted and carried on in different ways, via both fiction and nonfiction. Just a few things before we get started. Later in the event, we will have an audience Q&A section. If you would like to submit questions to our authors, you can do so by utilizing the Q&A module, which should be available at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions submitted by others that you really want to hear answers to. At the bottom of your screen, you'll also find the Zoom chat where you can comment along with the conversation. We suggest switching your chat to all panelists and attendees, which will make your comments available to the whole group. Let us know in the chat where you're joining us from today and what Jane Austen means to you. Already I'm seeing so many people from all over the world, which is incredible. Now I'm going to ask our authors to start their microphones and cameras and come onto the digital stage. And while they get settled, let me introduce you to this wonderful group. Hi guys. <laughs> Today's moderator is Devani Lozer. Devani is foundation professor of English at Arizona State University and the author or editor of nine books, including The Making of Jane Austen. Her essays have appeared in many outlets, including The Atlantic, The New York Times, and Salon. Her next book, Sister Novelist, is slated for fall 2021. And my favorite fun fact about Devani is she has played roller derby under the name Stone Cold Jane Austen, which I think is so cool. <laughs> Hi, Devani. Thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thank you, Marissa. Also with us today is Natalie Jenner, who worked for decades in the legal industry and founded an independent bookstore in Oakville, Ontario, where she lives with her family. Her first published novel, The Jane Austen Society, is set in the small English village of Chawton after World War II and tells the moving story of an unusual but like-minded group of people who unite over their shared love of Jane Austen to form a society to help preserve her legacy. Hi, Natalie. It's great to see you. Hi, Marissa. Thanks so much for having me today. Yeah, today's kind of like our own little meeting of the Jane Austen Society, right? <laughs> that was the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to bring everyone together. And next we have Rachel Cohen, an award-winning author of several books whose essays have appeared in outlets like The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Guardian. She also teaches in the creative writing program at the University of Chicago. Rachel's book is an account of a turbulent period in her life when she turned to Jane Austen to make sense of a new reality. Austen years winds together memoir, criticism, and historical material about Austen herself. Hi, Rachel. Thanks for being here. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Our next author is Janice Hadlow, who worked at the BBC for more than two decades and ran two of the broadcaster's major television channels. Her novel poses the question, what if Mary Bennett's life took a different path from that laid out for her in Pride and Prejudice? The other Bennett sister transforms Mary from bookish, ugly duckling to the protagonist of her own story. Hi, Janice. It's great to see you. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. And it's just so fantastic to see people from all over the world. It's, yeah. just, it's just brilliant. So brilliant to be here. And finally, we have with us Lucy Worsley, a historian, curator, television presenter, and best-selling author. Jane Austen at Home explores the many places that Jane Austen lived and the subject of home, which Austen returned to over and over in her novels. Welcome, Lucy. Nice to have you with us. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here with a thousand people, nearly, who all love right. <laughs> Jane. We've all that, got that in common, haven't we? And in a fun twist, Lucy, you mentioned that Janice is actually your much admired former boss from her days in British <laughs> <laughs> I used to be utterly terrified, but also uh, my feeling is mutual, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Love the small work. Um, as you can see, all these books are just so gorgeous. Um, these covers are incredible, and what's inside is even more incredible. You can learn about them and order your very own copies by visiting bit.ly slash celebration of Jane Books. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash celebration of Jane books. I'll add that link in the chat in just a minute. And now with all of that, I will turn things over to Devani to kick off our conversation. 
Thank you, Marissa. Uh, we are going to have such fun today. I am just so thrilled to have this honor to talk to these amazing authors of these four terrific books. And it's, uh, it's going to be a pretty good free-flowing conversation, followed by a lightning round of favorites of Austin, and then we'll open to your Q&A. So that's kind of where we're heading. And I thought we'd start with a round robin of questions just to you know, sort of break the ice, a little icebreaker question. <laughs> Of, you know, obviously this is what's bringing us together is the fact that we are in difficult times and that uh, the Jane Austen is somebody who's actually been read in difficult times in the past. So, you know, personal and social difficulties, moments of cataclysmic change and hope, all of us have this in common. But I want you to reach back to a time that may or may not be cataclysmic for you, but uh, is certainly important to all of us to hear about. I'd love to hear from each of you about your first memory of reading Austen. And Natalie, I thought we'd start with you. What's your first memory of reading Austen? Oh, it, it's right here. So it's my mother's book in a box. And it was on the shelves. And I was like, what's with the book in the box? And she's like, don't touch that book. And then one day I had to just go, you know, see. And when I opened it up, it had uh, these beautiful ink and wash illustrations. So I was nine. And I'm like looking, it's like, oh, there's pictures in my mother's book. And then I started to read the first chapter. And those first three chapters are quite short and pithy and very dialogue rich. So I remember reading the first chapter and I was a precocious early reader, but right away I'm reading the Bennett's and Mrs. Bennett's going on and on. And Mr. Bennett's dialogue is in third person. He's like, yeah, he's heard another field's let. And I was just like, this is like my parents dynamic. And then I was like, I think this is like everybody's parents. And I really just right away lobbed on to these people. And then that was it for me. I was, I was a goner. That's beautiful. I love that you've got the book right there too. Props, <laughs> right? <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, Janice, would you take that one? What was your first memory of Well, of um, I have a book too. <laughs> <laughs> so this was my first introduction to Jane Austen. Um, happy birthday to Janice. Hope you enjoy many hours of reading. Mm -hmm. 15th of the 11th 1974 <laughs> so I had never read Jane Austen before she wasn't taught at school where I went to school and I think I was about 15 when this was bought for me as a present and uh it's still covered in all my pencil markings uh, it still hasn't fallen apart it cost a princely sum of 40p which I think is about 50 cents in the US and um I never turned back really I suddenly when I started reading it I think I felt as I'd come home here was somebody who wrote I felt just for me, really. I loved everything about it. I loved the variety of the characters. I like being made to laugh sometimes. I didn't think that's what serious books did, make you laugh. Um, and I still, even now, I've got many, many, many versions of it because people over the years, knowing how much I love Austin, have given me many versions. But this battered old 50p version is still the one I really love. Beautiful, beautiful, thank you. Uh, Rachel, I have a feeling you're gonna have a lot to say about this one. <laughs> Tell us. Because I've written a memoir about reading Austin, I feel I'm sort of quoting myself or something. But um, uh, my my first uh, my first uh, clear memory is a sort of diffuse memory of um, long afternoons of reading. I high school, late junior high school, in my childhood room. Um, it had a green carpet. I would lie on the bed. I would be reading Austin, and then it would get dark, and I would have to get up and turn on a light. So I I sort of can can calibrate the degree of my immersion that I, that it was, it, it, it grew dark as I read. Um, and uh, so that's the, that's the sort of first atmosphere of my, of my reading Austin. And I um, am struck over and over by how, how much the memories of my life can hold together with Austin. It's as if her books are really receptive to memory and are ready to um, hold our memories in, in the books. And so I, 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 I think in talking to people, I find often people have different memories from different points in their lives that seem to sort of um, tie together with a, with a particular book of Austin's, which is in the end what my book is about. That's really beautiful. Lucy, love, let's hear from you. I saw you looking around at your bookshelves. <laughs> Well, I was looking at my bookshelf because I have exactly the same edition as Janice does somewhere. But as you can see, I don't keep my books in good order. So I wasn't immediately able to put my hand on it. I'd like to describe a slightly different experience, which is my experience of reading about the real Jane Austen for the first time. I remember the time I, I first really engaged with all the novels was during the stressful time of my final exams at college. And I would 
study all day and then in the evenings I would just go through them like a like a car driving through the territory of Jane Austen straight through and uh but what I particularly remember from when I was entering what Jane Austen herself calls the years of danger so <laughs> the late 20s that was the point at which life made me a feminist I think as it does for many people until that point I thought I could do anything in my late 20s I began to realize that I couldn't and at that point, I began reading about Jane Austen, the human being, and learning some of the things that she wasn't able to do in her life, and how utterly exceptional and inspirational and motivational she was as a writer and also as a human being. So that was my moment when I became a totally devoted, died in the wool, Jane Knight. That's, that's so beautiful. I, I know that there are lots of Jane Knights in the audience. I mean, we, the, the chat is just full of people from every continent you can imagine. I don't think I saw an Antarctica in there, but uh, at, from all over the world. And this is a story that we often tell, right? To, when we first come together uh, in, in communities and groups about where we first read her. So I, I really value all of these stories. And you may be interested to know that there are novelists of a hundred years ago who wrote these stories out as well. Uh, and maybe before that, but we're entering a, a long history of making sense of what it means to discover her and read her and your books are bringing her alive for us uh, anew. So I want, I want to ask a question next, and we'll go on this. Oh, did you have a follow-up, Lucy? Was that a hand? Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, uh, you know, mine was uh, my mother handing me a copy of Pride and Prejudice, and it took me three times before it really, really hit. I was really resistant. I felt the language was a little off. Uh, but the third time, I really got it. And it wasn't for me until much later, until I finished a PhD in women's writing, that I learned that my mother had never actually read Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> uh, she just knew it was a book that an educated girl should read. And yeah. honestly, that means even more to me. Uh, the idea that she was trying to give me access to, to culture, to ideas, and to education. And that Austin was a connection, even without having read her, that made that possible. Um, so, you know, all of these journeys are just so vibrant. Thank you for asking, Lucy. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not shy about telling that. Um, but I, I want to focus back on the books that you've just produced, this moment that we're in that is uh, this, this uh, Austin-inflected moment of thinking through how your books are out in the world and how Austin influenced your own book. And, and Natalie, I have a, a beautiful quote from what you call your histor historical note by the author at the end of your novel. I'm not, no plot spoilers. I'm not doing any plot spoilers here. But you, you talk about your characters as a group of people traumatized to varying degrees. And, you know, I'm wondering if you might want to say a little bit about that, but also just generally how Austin has influenced your own work or what made you want to write um, with and alongside her stories very interesting because like Rachel I was going through a particularly difficult time where my husband was given a, a very challenging medical diagnosis about three to four years ago and I immersed myself in Jane Austen I decided I'm just going to read the heck out of Jane Austen <laughs> because I know what I'm going to get from her and I'm going to learn some things about myself but I can also use the stories as distraction when I need to, there's safe suspense. So when I had gone through the six books, and as you all know, you can read them pretty quickly. <laughs> I started to read everything I could about her. Then I went to Chawton to spend a week immersed in this village because up until then it had been hurried family trips with an hour to run into the museum. There's the table, now the pub, you know, and I really wanted to have an ability to sink into it and pay homage to her. It was the 200th anniversary of her death in 2017. And eventually, I think what happened was I'm in a rabbit hole. And like Lucy said, I start to become very intrigued intellectually about her as a woman, how she found inner resilience and hope, how she heeded her inner conviction as an artist, um, her family's support, which was so beautiful. And I think they knew they had a genius in their midst, which is wonderful. And I wanted to stay in this world. So my work has been could not have been more influenced by Jane Austen because my book came about because after I had sort of burned through a year of what was unintentional research, I still wanted to be in Chawton and I wanted to be thinking about Jane Austen. So I used my book, my first published book at age 52. I used it as a chance to interrogate her texts through discussions with my characters, 
I also used it as a chance to explore some of her themes that have always resonated with me, such as authenticity and finding your own path to happiness and resisting CADs and familial pressure and other things. And I used it as a chance to also have fun and create parallels with some of her stories so I could stay immersed in her world. So I think in the end, my book really is a valentine to her and to the feelings that she can stir up on it in us at different times. And I'm just so grateful. I mean, I end my acknowledgments at the beginning of my book. I end with thanking her for the example she gave me in a very difficult time in life of finding hope and keeping going and just staying engaged in whatever way I could with life. And I think she's just an incredibly inspiring example as a person, as well as a genius of, of literature. Well, it's just a beautiful group of vibrant new characters you've given us. And, uh, you know, and we'll come back to, to hear some more about those too. Janice, I want to ask you the same question, but I really think it's important that we hear the first line of your novel. And I'm wondering if, do you want to read it? Would you, do you have it there? I'll have to find it. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I just think it, it's, <laughs> again, no plot spoilers. I'm not doing plot spoilers today, no, but it's, it's just... Sure. It is a sad fact of life that if a young woman is, in, is unlucky enough to come into the world without expectations, she had better do all she can to ensure she's born beautiful. To be poor and handsome is misfortune enough, but to be penniless and plain is a hard fate indeed. Oh, and it's, a, it's amazing, and I, I want to hear more, but obviously for those who don't know it, The Other Bennett Sister is about Mary Bennett, and that line is introducing us to her story, uh, and I, I loved reading your reimagining of her in, the, in that world that many of us know so beautifully and so well, but obviously Austin influenced that work very directly, but do you want, do you want to go in a direction with this question? How did you, how did you come to the idea of this novel, or what, what made you want to pursue this? Well, I think, I think um, I've been reading Pride and Prejudice for many, many years, and uh, I think for a long time, um, you just don't notice Mary really very much at all. She's, a, she's, a, a, she's almost a comic character, really. You know, she sits in the corner. Whenever she speaks, everybody raises their eyes. Uh, she has nothing really to contribute. She's alone in a family. Nobody she has no particular friends. No one cares for her. Um, but you don't really notice her very much because all eyes are on Lizzie. You know, Lizzie is such an extraordinarily powerful spark. I mean, Jane Austen calls the novel light, bright and sparkling. And Lizzie is the quintessence of that, really. But after a while, I think once I'd noticed Mary, um, I began to feel a sense of sympathy for her, really, which, her, which uh, Jane Austen certainly doesn't have. Uh, you know, she's pretty merciless to Mary. She doesn't cut her. She's not allowed to do anything well even the most famous scene in which she figures when she's uh, stopped by Mr. Bennett from carrying on playing the piano at Elizabeth's prompting because uh, she's embarrassing the family. She's not even allowed the little triumph of being allowed to be a decent pianist. Everything that she does has to be taken away from her in some way. And I started thinking, um, I wonder, we meet, when we first meet, meet Mary, she's about 17 and she's already a prig and somebody who we're not, we're not encouraged to think positively of. And I just began to wonder how she'd ended up like this. You know, what on earth had happened to her in this household to be a turnout that she had? And once I started doing that, I couldn't really stop. And once I started thinking about what the world of Longbourn might look like from Mary's point of view, what it was like to watch Elizabeth and Jane uh, at, at work, as it were, what it was like to be the elder plain middle sister of Lydia, how hard that life must have been. Um, I think it's Ian Foster who says that, uh, that behind every Jane Austen character, there's a novel waiting to be written. And I, I just felt very strongly that here was this awkward, plain girl uh, who Austen makes it very clear, has taken to study to get some level of distinction, to get, be allowed some level of identity in a family that prizes only wit and beauty, and she seems to have neither. Um, and I wanted to see what that world looked like from her perspective. And once I got into her head, I also wanted to know, well, what if she'd been given the, the, the privileges of a heroine that Jane Austen doesn't allow her? We'd actually been allowed to find out her, her, how her story ends. What would that have looked like? And that's really why I ended up writing the book that I had. Well, it's, it's also a beautiful novel. And I'd say one of my favorite parts was seeing what Mary reads. And uh, for me to see the name of Catherine McCauley, the celebrated female historian in the pages of the novel, it's a special thrill. Uh, but you, you give us uh, just such a rich world of Mary's interior life. And I'm just so grateful for that. So thank you. Uh, 
Rachel, I want to turn next to you and ask you about influence. And obviously your book is all about influence. Uh, but the, the line that really sticks with me is uh, you say, there is depth in doing the same thing over, but differently. Uh, and that this describes some of the ways that you brought Austin into the book and that she worked in your life. I'm, I'm hoping you'll tell us, uh, it's obviously it's the whole point of the book, but talk about influence and Austin and influence on you and wanting to write about her. Thank you for that nice question and for, and for all this assembly. Um, I think I'm gonna uh, take a leap out of um, the way that you prompted Janice and yeah. start by reading the first sentence of my book. Please, yes, yes. Situate it in a way. Yeah. Um, so um, my book, uh, the first uh, chapter is called A Reader and it starts about seven years ago, not too long before our daughter was born and a year before my father died. Jane Austen became my only author. I began to read her before sleep every night and when I woke in the night. And I read her at my desk when I couldn't make progress with the biography I was supposed to have finished writing and on the slow bus that crossed the river to the OBGYN. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, Austen, Austen became a part of all the moments of my day in a way that um, really surprised me. I was not expecting that. I, I had read Austen in high school as described um, quickly and it hadn't, it had not occurred to me that I might become an, um, a serious devoted Austin reader. Um, and then it sort of happened to me in a period when my father died and the children were born. And I, I think um, there were different things that, I mean, it, it, Austin for me in my own maturity, I, I I found her as a mature novelist, a little bit as other people have been saying, and I, I hadn't taken that in. When I read her as a young person, I thought of her as a writer for young people. And, um, and then it turned out she's a writer for all ages, and you find yourself again in her as you, as you come back. So you're exactly right about the emphasis in my book on doing it again. I, I found a lot by just returning and returning and returning. And one of the things that I, um, I really found was that uh, partly, you know, if you have little children, or I think all of us are feeling this right now in our domestic circumstances where our lives are so kind of narrowed into our households and everything is happening in one place, is that um, the sort of tighter your domestic circumstances are, the more you're interrupted. Life is just constant interruption. One thing is angling in on another thing. And Jane Austen was an absolute master of interruption. Like she managed interruption in her own life. There's the famous stories of, of how she would write while other people were coming into the room and she would cover over her novels. And I, I've always loved this detail in her biography that she, there was a swinging door to the room where she would work and it, it squeaked. And they were gonna fix the squeak, but she said, no, no, don't fix the squeak because that way I know when somebody's coming. And so I have a second to adjust to the interruption. And I sort of, I felt like that person who could sort of understand continuity and interruption in that way was incredibly necessary to me. Um, when there were little children who were constantly interrupting my um, minutes. And when the grief for my father was this kind of huge, um, schism in my life, like a, a, a very serious bifurcating kind of interruption. So as a, as a person who was sort of able to surmount interruption, she became very important to me. And then writing, I, I really found the more I delved into it, the richer it got so that I had started just as a reader of the novels an obsessional reader sentence by sentence. Um, and like Natalie said, it was, it was like, in my case, it was like three years of unintentional research. I was just reading them. I didn't think I was writing a book, uh, but I'm a slow writer. And so seven years went by. And, um, and then there was a lot of, there were sort of concentric rings of research in which I started to encounter all the wonderful work that's been done about Austin. And that really enriched what I was doing, the work of the people here and of many, you know, all the people that we're all indebted to. Um, Austin has just has made a wonderful rich world of people who study Austin. Um, and I, I think the, the last thing I would say is that I think Austin herself really encourages our participation in her world. She loved the theater and she was really interested in creating 
um, kind of scenes that would have a theatrical quality. And part of that is that it invites you to be an actor or to think about inhabiting these, um, these spaces in a way. They're part of this fairness of the novels leaves room for, for many different kinds of people. And that's also been striking to me in thinking about her work. So um, in the American context, um, a writer like ta Coates, who you wouldn't necessarily think of as an Austinite, is an Austinite and is um, thinking about how the books leave space for him. Or I was influenced by Azar Nafizi's account of reading um, Jane Austen in Tehran. And those places that, you, that are far flung as our audience is today, it turns out that um, there's sort of room for all of us in in Austin, and that's that's been encouraging to me too to feel that I was joining this kind of larger community of people who who found room there in those books. So I think alongside is a good is a good word in the question. Yeah, uh, and you know, I, I as a critic, I loved seeing the ways that you used books and and telling stories of reading and stories of your life. And you had an, another great line that I think just to follow up what you said there. Brutality, subjection, and greed were not absent from uh, from her books, from Austin's books. I had just not I, I had just not known how to look for them. And so, you know, thank you very much for that line too. Fabulous, uh, Lucy. Want to turn on to uh, Jane Austen at home? Which uh, you know, one of the things that I love about this book, many things to love about it, including that there's a television show to go along with it. So how can you not love that, right? <laughs> but but the, the book itself, I I really appreciate how it's divided. It's a biography, but it's divided into acts, like a play or a film, and I love that choice. And also one line from you that really strikes me is, every generation gets the Jane Austen it deserves, and th that you tease this out in the course of the book as well. Uh, what would you like to tell us about how Austen influenced your work? Obviously, again, an enormous question that you've answered through your work itself, but please try to go in a direction with that. We'd love to hear. Well, I was writing actually in the context in Britain of a great campaign to get a picture of Jane Austen onto our uh, money, onto the banknote. Uh, because astonishingly at that time, there was only two females in the whole of the faces on our money, and one of those was the queen. <laughs> so I was thinking, why should people care about Jane Austen enough to want to put her onto a banknote in, it was around 2017, the year of her centenary. And uh, one of the ways in which I think that she, she speaks to people of our current generation is that she exceeded expectations for Georgian women. On, on almost every level. And what people don't necessarily realize about her own life is that she wasn't swanning around in big country houses, uh, as you might assume, you know, you think balls, tea parties, lovely dresses, army officers. Actually, her real life was quite challenging, not materially challenging, but challenging in the sense that she came from this level of society that was all about keeping up appearances and pretending to be posher and richer than you really were. And actually her life was uh, lived in a sort of a contingent makeshift way. She was often a guest in the houses of richer people. It was only in later life in her happy third act that she found a place that she could really call home, I suppose. And when I thought, well, what can I say about Jane Austen? The answer came to me that because in my day job, what I, what I actually do all day is work as a curator and as a historian in Britain's royal palaces. So I, I felt that I could perhaps bring to the party some of my knowledge of the, the way in which society worked in the past. And one example of this that I, I, I like to share is that imagine, for example, you're living in a large family of clergymen's children in rural Hampshire and money is short. There are long rainy winter evenings to get through in Hampshire. How do you entertain all of these children? when candles are really expensive. To burn a beeswax candle was like burning money. What do you do? You light just one candle and one member of the family reads aloud to the others as a form of, you know, like a television, as a form of entertainment. And I was struck by Natalie talking about the dialogue and Rachel talking about the theatricality. Jane Austen's works are almost intended to be performed like a radio play. And if you look at the actual, um, the, the, the little bits that do survive of her real actual handwriting of the novels, you can see that when she brings in a new character, she sometimes puts a little dash, just like the person being brought into the script of a play. 
So, you know, one reason for Jane Austen's existence as a writer is the price of Georgian home lighting. So beautiful. And if you've, if you've seen the documentary uh, that Lucy has done, then you need to read the book. And if you've read the book, then you need to see the documentary. I just have a very vivid picture of you in, uh, in the floor of a decrepit ballroom from, from that show. And I take that with me and I use that in my teaching. And it's, uh, it's just, it's beautiful work you've done. Thank you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Natalie, I want to shift back to you. I want to give you an opportunity. Do you, is there something you'd like to read? Is there a line you want to read from your novel? If not, we can, we can move in another direction. But I, I realized that I didn't give you that chance. Oh, actually, just one of my favorite lines that I have memorized, and it's very short. It was the moment when I was writing that I knew I was going to be really writing about Jane Austen. I thought I was going to be writing about a group of people trying to save an old British house. But I have this farmer at the beginning who has lived in Chawton his whole life, never read her. He encounters a stranger, and he takes the book out of the library. And I just never forget the moment where I type this line, he was getting worried for Mr. Darcy. And that was the beginning of him falling in love with Jane Austen the way that we all do and relating to her characters because they're so real. And I think part of her genius is that quick and easy characterization. And you can just like, you know, Rachel was saying, you can like go right into that text yourself and you can really relate to these people and learn from them. And that line for me is sort of a fulcrum in my book and in the journey to my book. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, and the, the next question I have that I'd love to do uh, hear from all of you is about why we should read Austin inspired books today. I mean, obviously a pandemic, uh, a global search for racial justice, much more time spent in the home for many people who can. Uh, these, these are different contexts in which to read Austin. What do you think we should be thinking about as we read Austin today through your own books? Obviously, read all four of these books, <laughs> but uh, anything you want to add to that as well, Natalie? Oh, I, I mean, I think, I think Jane Austen is a really wonderful example of someone in control as they write at the highest level. And I think when you read her, there's something about her mastery of prose and her mastery of her characters that makes you feel in control as well. So I just feel like she's this very benevolent kind of God with this very sort of sometimes forgiving iron fist. And she is going to give us exactly at the end and her characters what they deserve. So there's a certain like the arc of justice kind of bends in about 360 pages. And you kind of know while you're reading her, even if you're a first time reader, you know it's probably all going to work out okay. So there's that element of safe suspense, which I think is very comforting for people in difficult times. Because I think in times of uncertainty, we are struggling to feel some hope and some control. And I know that in writing my book, one of the things I was getting from it in using the omniscient narrative voice that she does, and then going into different consciousness, I was feeling in control while I wrote. And I think that you're in the hand of the master when you read her book. So you get that element from her. I also love the fact that she does create the safe suspense. And I think it was Martin Amos in The New Yorker or Julian Barnes, I think it was Julian Barnes, who said that there's this compulsiveness to Pride and Prejudice in particular, where every time you read it, no matter how many times you read it, you're like, my God, how is Darcy going to overcome that botched first proposal? <laughs> and I know with persuasion, every time I read persuasion, I'm like, oh God, does Captain Wentworth still have feelings for Anne? Like there's something brilliant in how she front loads these texts. And even though you know what's going to happen, you still get a bit of a thrill without the worry of like a head in the freezer kind of thriller, you know? So there's this element to her books that has safe suspense, which I think leads to catharsis. So I think the last thing I would say for me is in terms of people turning to her books and books about her is that there is a beauty in the happy ending and in fairness and in justice. And I think that her books aren't about marriage so much as they are about people heeding their inner conviction, finding hope when life is giving you no hope at all and just finding a way to keep engaging and going forward and doing that while staying true to yourself. And she allows her characters to be flawed. Emma is flawed. Lizzie is flawed. You know, there's like, they all have things about them that are relatable for us as readers. So as we read these books, I do believe that we see flawed, relatable human beings find a better path, lift each other up in their community. I mean, that picnic scene in Emma, it's so scathingly, you know, like it just comes out of nowhere. But I think it's the key to her view on community, which is no, 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 we're not gonna do that. We're gonna have a higher bar than that because we're gonna lift each other up and we're all in this together. 
And when I read her books, I do feel this sense of we are all in this together. And that's why I read her. I think and others should. Your novel gives us a chance too to think about the formation of institutions to recognize authors and communities of readers. And I, yeah. I'm grateful for it for that reason too. So mm -hmm. thank you. Janice, where do you want to go with this one? Well, I think we carry on reading her first and foremost because she's a genius. I mean, it's as simple as that. You know, for me, she's the she's the model of what great writing's like, and for that reason alone, I would carry on reading her forever. But I do think there are some possible reasons why she's particularly appealing. Well, first of all, in fact, in, in difficult times. I mean, sometimes I think the assumption is that this is escapism, and I think maybe they haven't read her. <laughs> you know, she's she's never ever sentimental. She's a tough yeah. old bird, Jane Austen, and that's why I love her. She has a, a kind of mercilessness to her in a way where she simply will not give you, I mean, it's true that the happy end, that there are very good happy endings for the central characters, but she's not afraid to give quite dismal endings to other characters. Uh, Mary Bennett being a good example <laughs> of that, who ends up uh, sitting forever with Mrs. Bennett in the living room and you think that I'm not sure I would wish on anybody um, and I quite like I quite like the fact that although that she has that sort of uh, almost a kind of modern sense of um, not everything is going to be wonderful but you're still going to enjoy it which I really love about her but I think there are many other reasons why possibly uh, she feels very timely now um, she just loves women she just writes about women and women of every possible kind. She does write about beautiful women, but she writes about young women, old women, nice women, selfish women. Every kind of female character is there and given their own space, which I think is, is comparatively rare in, in, in earlier literature and possibly even so now. Um, I, she passes the Bechtel test so regularly that she, it's as though you, know, you, you are immersed in a feminine world, which I found very attractive. And I also think that sometimes people who don't like her will sometimes say, well, it's just about happy endings, isn't it? And of course, to some extent, that's true. They, this, these are stories which do always end in a marriage. But I don't think that's the key point of what they're about. I think that what these stories are really about, picking up what I was saying about women, is that they're about journeys to self-knowledge. So that every single Austin heroine has to go on that journey. She never ends up thinking the same things about herself that she thought at the beginning. And I think that's, that's, she has to go through a, a sense of identifying what she really wants out of life, who she really believes she is. And sometimes that will involve throwing away an identity that's been created for her by her family, by friends, by other people. And that feels to me like a very, it's a, it's a very positive, it's a very positive thing to read about is the sense of actually somebody, it's not, to some extent they are about growing up, they're about maturity, but they're also about courage and conviction and having the ability to be able to say, this is what I want, because the only way the Jane Austen heroine is going to find the right man to marry is if she really, really knows herself. Mm -hmm. And that idea that actually self-knowledge is a powerful thing for women, it's a tool for them in learning how to be themselves, but also that actually um, it's, it's, it's as important, if you like, as what it produces, that, that sense of knowing who you are and not also having to settle for the cards that life has dealt you. You know, you, you, do have, you do have agency here. You are able, even within the comparatively enclosed world of late 18th century Hertfordshire, there might be ways in which you can assert who you are. That doesn't mean to say you're going to turn into Austen herself or into Mary Shelley. It doesn't mean to say you will be a genius, but there are ways nevertheless by which you can find some kind of identity for yourself. And I think that resonates very powerfully over the over the generations. You feel you feel it now as powerfully as I think you must have done when you read it first of all. That's a beautifully put. Beautifully put, uh, and it makes me glad this is being recorded so that we can re-listen to the, the bits we want to we want to go back and, and get more carefully. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, well, yeah, I'm I'm moved by the answers that we already have. I I, um, I guess I would add that. Um, uh, I noticed uh, the more I went back to Austin, the more I found a kind of alternation in her books between kind of brighter books and more somber ones. So Sense and Sensibility and Mansfield Park and um, Persuasion all have kind of melancholy elements, um, uh, times when the main characters wish they could speak but are silent, times when, um, when they're in mourning, especially in Persuasion. And I noticed in looking through the chat that there are a lot of people for whom Persuasion is an important book. And I think Persuasion is one that people are reading a lot right now. And I hear from people that that's one that they've been drawn to in this kind of pandemic time. And 
Um, that's a book that I use as a kind of thread that recurs all the way through my own book. Um, it was the one that kind of held me to Austin, I think, um, during this time. And the fact that Anne is in mourning for her, um, for her mother, that she's in a kind of mourning for the relationship she lost when she was younger, and that everyone in that book is in mourning because it's, it's the end of the Napoleonic period, and there's been so much war. I, every single person in that book is a widow or is wearing black for somebody or is, um, so I think that we, we tend to focus on the delightful Austin, the merry Austin, the, um, uh, the witty Austin, but there, but there is this somberness in her that's, that's even very powerful in the context of her still being so witty. It's a very interesting kind of um, dynamic there. And so I, I, I do return to those books in, in, this, in this time and to Emma also, I'm teaching Emma at the moment. So um, uh, there's, there's both, both things really call me. And I guess the other thing I would say is that the more I learned about the biography and history, the kinds of things that come out in Lucy's book, or in Paula Byrne's book, or in Claire Tomlin's book, the more I felt um, that I hadn't understood the backgrounds and how significant the backgrounds are. So that um, there's a tiny mention in Mansfield Park of the slave trade. And um, it seems it's easy to pass by it. I, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker recently that was about kind of pulling that out and letting that um, thinking, reproportioning. And I, I think that that's something that we're all doing in this moment is, is thinking, okay, I may have looked at this, but not with the right proportions. Like I, that, the abolitionist movement was very significant to Jane Austen and to her brothers, and they were sailing in the active suppression of the slave trade after 1807. And so for her, a little mention is meant to really resound for, for her readers. And so I, I'm, have been learning all through the last years to read her with a more global, more open kind of point of view. The things are there in those books. You just may overlook them. And so that's been, I really, I really learned a lot from just staying with it and following the trails that other writers um, have led me, have led, have, you know, have opened up. And then I, I say, oh, okay, now, now I, I can read this more deeply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Well, during the whole period of the lockdown, I personally uh, was spending a lot of time at home and the world shrank, wasn't able to travel, living in a really small, tight, close community where nothing happened from day to day. Just like the Georgian drawing rooms in which Nelson and her kind were all going slowly mad. <laughs> and I felt that I, I felt a, a sort of affinity for what her life must have been like, which led me to an even greater realization of just how exceptional and courageous she was not to do the thing that everybody expected, which was to marry money, mm -hmm. and instead to do this astonishingly innovative and courageous thing, which was to start to make her way in the world as a professional writer instead. And Janice, you said these books aren't happy ending romance stories at all. I think all of these books have a message, which is how rubbish it is that Georgian women are put in this position where they are expected to marry for money. And I think that sitting there writing away, she was actually blowing the locks off the doors for the Georgian drawing room. Mm. And oh, that's, it's, I, I, don't, I don't quite know what that, that means for now that we're able to go out in the world a little bit again. I think it's a reminder that we need to, we need to break out of our circumstances. That's a beautiful answer too. I think we should move to the lightning round. Uh, and what, I, what we have here prepared are some questions with very brief answers required from you in which you tell us your favorite such and such. And we're gonna start with your favorite Jane Austen novel, Natalie. Pride and Prejudice. Janice. I find it a really tough call between Pride and Prejudice and Persuasion, and I think it would depend very much what mood I was in, but one of those two definitely. We'll allow that answer. Rachel. <laughs> um, persuasion and Emma. Uh, yes, somehow the, I, I actually love them together. Beautiful. And Lucy. It's the one that has a heroine who's a bit difficult to like, is a bit too full of herself, thinks she's cleverer than everybody else, and I can't think why Emma appeals to me. 
All right, so much one could say to these, but we're gonna move right along. Best movie adaptation, Natalie. Ang Lee's Sense of Sensibility for 1995. Janice, what's yours? I was just thinking, 1995, what a year. I mean, not only that, not only that choice from Natalie, but also my two, which would be the classic Pride and Prejudice, 95, with Colin Firth and, and Persuasion in the same year. That version of Persuasion, which I think is absolutely brilliant and uh, beautiful performances from everyone, including realistic George and Stubble. Yeah. Beautiful. You've got movie or TV? Yeah, Rachel. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think of Emma Thompson as a, as a crucial uh, co-creator of that sense and sensibility and, and love it. And then the other would be Patricia Rosima's Mansfield Park. Oh, I love it. Really <laughs> wonderful and brings out all the undercurrents um, and makes yeah. them overcurrents in a strange way. How about you, Lucy? I'm going to say the Mansfield Park that you just mentioned, Rachel, mm -hmm. and I have a curious reason, which is that at the time I was the curator of this wonderful ruin called Kirby Hall in Northamptonshire, oh. where the film was made. Oh. All right, this is an obligatory question. Best Darcy. And by this, we mean actor Darcy. Natalie. I'm an outlier. 1980, Faye Weldon scripted Masterpiece Theater, Pride and Prejudice, David Rintel. Call it for a second. I, there's something about being 12 and seeing Pride and Prejudice on screen for the first time. <laughs> Janice, what do you think? Well, it's a cliche, I know, but I'm sorry. Nobody does it better than Colin Firth. I, I think he is quintessential Austin hero through and through, and he's the act that everyone else has to beat. I'm with you. Rachel? Uh, yeah, I have to follow with Colin Firth also, though I'm not an expert. I don't feel that I've... <laughs> <laughs> and Lucy? I'm going to give a twist on the Colin Firth answer. I actually really like him when he was in Bridget Jones's diary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that there was a sexy Darcy Colin before Colin Firth, Colin Keith Johnston in 1935. Uh, he's my first hot Darcy. Okay, so Jane Austen character you are most like. This will be the last question of the lightning round. And there are lots of possible answers here, Natalie. I wish I was Elizabeth Bennet. But I fear I am an Emma very much. <laughs> Janice. Well, we'd all like to be Lizzie, but I'm rather afraid I might be Mary. <laughs> <laughs> that that a seems lot, appropriate and beautiful. A, a lot more of us, I suspect, know what it is to feel like Mary, awkward, out of place, not always saying the right thing, than we know how it is to be Lizzie, I think. <laughs> uh, how about you, Rachel? Uh, it's, a, it's a hope rather than it, but I, I think Anne in Persuasion is the one I'm, I'm most trying, trying to think about or be close to. And that last scene she has where she really speaks for herself is, is, um, is my aspiration. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And Lucy? I'm with Natalie. I feel um, Emma, but I didn't think that reflects particularly well on me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, we want to turn to some of your questions now. Uh, and there are many of them, so many of them uh, going on in the Q&A that we can choose from. Uh, some of you uh, want to know, and the, you know, some of these questions we've already answered, which characters are your favorites? Are there any of those you want to, anything you want to say about characters you haven't had a chance uh, to, uh, to say? That's, that's a question from uh, Mihalina Perez uh, wants to know, oh, sorry, she had a different question. This one is from, Lucy Sprague Fredrickson, who wants to know what characters are your favorites and any author can answer. Did you already get out what you wanted to say by the one you identified with or do you have more on these? Can I say that I have a, I'm, I'm very, very fond of Mary Crawford. I think she's a, a fantastic character and uh, I often wondered what happened to her next. Yes, yes. Uh, Maybe I would just add that I, I, a thing I love in Janice's book is the is the following down another another route, um, sort of route through a book and um, and that I think a lot of the minor characters actually encourage that and I find if I really pay Miss Bates I find very hard to pay attention to in Emma but the more you pay attention to Miss Bates the more it changes Emma mm -hmm. so I think there are a lot of a lot of the so-called minor characters really open out worlds if you kind of resituate and start to think of the novel from their point of view. Very true. Well, that's beautiful too. That's beautiful too. All right, we have a question from Sarah. She wants to know what impact do you think or potential impact do you think 
Reading Austin has on teenagers today? Well, I think Janice really brilliantly answered it when she talked about this world of women. Because one of the things I got as an adolescent in reading Jane Austen was that sense of having very contained life, not feeling a lot of freedom yet, concerned about attractiveness, chances of matrimony, like looking at love, um, wondering how your life was going to go. And seeing these characters, Fanny Price is one of them, Anne Elliot's another one, Elizabeth, obviously, Lizzie Bennet, be so um, true to themselves and create their path and stay on it no matter what, despite temptations or social pressure. And I found as a teenage girl that those lessons just really resonated with me and inspired me. That's beautiful. Anybody else want to take that one? Well, we have another question from Mihalina Perez, and I mentioned before. She wants to know how you feel about the recent Sanditon adaptation and its ending. If it, some of you have seen it, some of you haven't. What do you think about it, the fact that it ends in a way that doesn't end, which you know, I find personally very amusing, <laughs> that, it, uh, that it ends in a cliffhanger uh, and rather than providing a closure? Nobody wants to touch this one. All right, Mihalina, you might be on your own on this one. <laughs> I can, well, I can, but then I'll, I'll just say I think it's, uh, I, I think it's uh, amazing and amusing that that novel has so often been left unfinished. <laughs> okay, so Kenny, what is one question you would want to ask Jane Austen face to face? Kenny wants to know. No one question would be enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing about thinking, sometimes you think to yourself, um, how amazing it would be to meet meet her and then you have to remember what I was saying earlier on there is that merciless side to her and you might not like <laughs> you might not necessarily like the version of you that she uh, that she put in her letters for example uh, you know might put, you, you, you'd go in there with a lot of it's interesting that um, I was reading recently she was very aware of what people thought about her books and she canvassed opinion from all the local friends and relations about what people thought they're very amusing you can find them on the internet and I think the other thing was that people were obsessed by the idea that they were characters in her book. So if you lived locally to her, you were convinced that you were Charlotte Lucas or that you, or that you were somebody they knew. And uh, I think that would be quite a terrifying thought that you might be put in one of her books. <laughs> That's amazing. So Kate wants to know, what do you think of Jane's silence in her writing? Anybody want to take that one? Rachel, you would seem a good person to, to address this if you'd be willing. Sure, I, I, I wish I knew more about what the writer meant by silence, but maybe the, the way that you, that you often don't know that she's there, like that there's a sort of um, feeling that the, the characters are speaking for themselves. I, again, I go back to thinking about the theater and the way that a playwright is sort of setting things up that then actors are gonna um, take. And I, I do feel that she was really influenced by that and that she was very often looking to Shakespeare. I was thinking that a question I might ask her if I could meet her would be about her reading because I think her reading was so important to her and there's not that much documentation. We know what books were in her father's library and there's places where she's obviously referring to one of the important women novelists of her time or to Walter Scott or to other things or where Walter Scott's referring to her. but. I really would love to know how she thought about reading. I just think it was so crucial to her. Um, and uh, I think that in the um, uh, silence of um, the way that she, she leaves a space there, I think you see that coming in the few times where we can tell that she revised, like in the mm -hmm. last scene of Persuasion or which where we use one of the few places where we have the early version and the late version. Um, you feel that she's finding ways to kind of let the characters do it among themselves and kind of step out a little bit herself. Um, and it's very powerful. And so I think she was probably looking for that, trying to feel that um, where that, where those spaces were that she could like where the characters would really be doing it and she could pull back a little bit. Um, and that when she found that that's when something would really open that she that that became part of the finished novel for her um and then she burned up the other stuff so we don't we don't have it but that's that guess is really following virginia wolf who's written very well i think about um about what she suspected austin's process to be 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, and thanks to St. Martin's for pulling these questions for us. We have one from Elaine. Is there a particular scene from any of Austin's novels that has helped or inspired you in these strange and difficult times? A scene we're looking for here. Anybody want to take this one? Lucy, would you be willing to give us a, a scene or a, it, some part of Austin that you think back to? I mean, oh, I, yeah. The, the, the fly on the wall situation, which I would have liked to have experienced in Jane Austen's own life, was the night she broke off her engagement. Mm. And in case you don't know the story, she was at this point approaching the years of danger. She's had a few offers of marriage and then she got a very good one from a proper man with a proper mansion. The only problem was he had a slightly unfortunate name, which was Mr. Harris Big Wither. And he was a pretty awful man. And we know that she accepted. Everyone was delighted. The family of her friends, she would be, you know, she got on so well with her sisters. It was all great. But then there was this night when she decided that she just couldn't go through with it. And that seems to me a, a fulcrum point in her own life when she, she, she switched from what she was supposed to do to what she wanted to do. And I think she made that decision because she just got her first book deal for the book that would be. <laughs> I do the same thing. <laughs> I think although it's perhaps not directly related to our current circumstances, you can never read the famous scene with um, uh, Lizzie Bennet and uh, Lady Catherine and not feel somehow uh, absolutely energized and pleased yeah. about it. It's like yeah. a kind of amazing tennis match of cleverness going back once, back and back and back. Yeah. And at the end of it, you just feel, wow, <laughs> what an amazing, what an amazing bit of writing it is. And to see two very different women, both of whom in their own way are rather formidable. And to see what happens at the end of that, I think is, is sort of classic Austin really. And whenever I get to it in Pride and Prejudice, we were talking earlier on about how the unique talent, well, one of the talents of the way she writes is that even when you've read it lots and lots of times, it's almost as though you come to it anew. When you when you get into that scene, you just think, I can't, I can't wait for more of it. Bring it on. It's just so exciting. Uh, and never ever read it without feeling sort of exhilarated and amazed at the same time. So Brittany wants you to recommend your favorite biography of Jane Austen. Lucy's, of course, belongs on that list, <laughs> but uh, others, others that that, uh, that you would. Favorite, which I, I mentioned in the intro, actually, is the one by Claire Tomlin. Claire Tomlin. I read when I was approaching the years of danger, and suddenly realized the the real woman. It was like discovering a whole other Austin heroine, but who was even better because she was real. Yeah. And Rachel, the, the other thing to read is um, uh, which. We know obviously that Cassandra uh, disposed of many of any of the letters that Jane Austen wrote that might that might have been thought to be uh, reflect badly on the family and on her, but the letters that are left are just so remarkable and uh, edited by Deirdre Le Fay. And if you just want to have uh, an amazing volume by the side of your bed, which you can just read a few, many, as many as you want. And to hear that characteristic Austin voice and to be plunged literally into that world of the price of lace and how many letters can you afford to send and how much paper have we used this week. Uh, I just can't recommend them highly enough. So they're not a novel exactly and not a biography, but they are the authentic voice of Austin. But I want you towards the end when she's getting ill and we know that and she doesn't. Yes, it's just heartbreaking. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. And when she moves to Hampshire, they go to Winchester for, because they think that she's getting better. And we realise that she's not coming back from Winchester and she's only in her 40s. I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's almost unbearable to read. But I do recommend them. They're just such entertaining and, and moving, as you say, often very moving because we have knowledge that she doesn't. Well, I feel like we would be remiss with, oh, go ahead. Do you want to, Rachel, and then I'll go to the next question, please. I was just going to say they're companionable also, which is, a, which is another wonderful thing about just being in the company of those letters, because they, many of them were written to her sister, and so they assume this closeness, and you get to kind of be of that relationship in a way that's wonderful. I, I would also say the Paula Byrne biography, I think, is really an interesting and, and good one. I also, the Claire Tomlin one was how I came in, and... Um, and then, you know, a, a wonderful thing in Lucy's biography is that there's, there's this discovery of all this cache of material that then you're able to make use of in your book of the, the actual domestic items um, 
that um, that what that sort of adds a whole new um, dimension, I think. But the the Paula Byrne is also very inventively structured by following through different um, different um, objects or things which would be sort of important, and and she gets to a lot of interesting things that way. So I think that's really a good book. Um, one thing we haven't touched on in Lucy's book is so brilliant um, is the importance of home for Jane Austen, and I think that one of the things that I and most cognizant of is how important a certain degree of certainty is in life. And I think that's something that a lot of people are struggling with now um, because our days and our hours seem so uncertain. And we know that Jane Austen went radio silent-ish for about eight or nine years, um, started the Watsons, but that was pretty much all we have a record of. And I thought Lucy's book in particular does a really important job of sort of using her different homes and houses and experiences of settlement um, as showing the arc of her development of her emotional life and where she got sustenance and energy from. And there's lessons in there for us too, which is trying to find certainty where we can. And for me, it was writing my book. It gave me that sense of control that I was missing in my life. And Rachel, um, you would have found, right? I mean, it's, it's brilliant that she continues to give all of us this gift um, that we can draw certainty from her. May, may I that? Raising your hand, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Natalie has raised an important point for every Jane lover who might be watching. There's a place that's in a great deal of uncertainty at the moment, and that's Jane Austen's house. Actually, yeah. the two houses in yeah. the village of, of Chawton, you may have read in the press that uh, the COVID caused immense financial instability yeah. for them. And there has been a bit of a crowdfunding campaign already to try and help them stay open for all of us. And if you've got any spare change at the moment, I know it's, I know it's a thing that's in short supply. Well, both Natalie and I would suggest that you think about them as the recipient. Uh, this, is, this is a subject of Natalie's novel, so it's, it's a perfect, uh, perfect moment too, Lucy, obviously. The Jane Austen House Museum, the Chawton House, the Great House that Jane spent so much time in, and of course, our Jane Austen societies globally. These are, these are all worthy things. I know many of you, it's what brought you here, but I'm so glad. Thank you, Lucy, for, for bringing it in. I think we have time for one more question, we're, we're drawing on to a close here, uh, but I'd love to hear from any of you, uh, from Sari, she wants to know if you have a favorite Jane Austen quote, would you share it with us? Mine is sense and sensibility, and I'm terrible at quoting, I will get it wrong. <laughs> know your own happiness. Um, all it wants is patience or give it another name, hope. Yeah. And I love the way she merges patience and hope together in, in, a, in a way there that I just find really inspiring. Thank you. And I think it can be a quote or paraphrase, some words that- <laughs> That, uh, words that, that was that the paraphrase, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful one, it's a beautiful one. I think one. persuasion, I think, I mean, I may not get the quote exactly right, but I, I think the, the quote that goes along the line of, uh, we women have the unenviable gift of loving longest when all hope is gone. Uh, that moment when uh, Captain Wentworth he overhears Anne Elliot talking to his colleague about the fact that he's lost his wife. And there's something that is a very resonant idea, I think, that um, hope endures even when it has no need to. And it often stays in my mind. It's a lovely one too. Yeah, Rachel, do you have one you want to offer? I, I was thinking of that of that one too, which is matters a lot to me. But the uh, one I would uh, say is um, a little bit of Pride and Prejudice. That's an epigraph for my book, which um, is just she read it again. Widely different was the effect of a second perusal. Mm -hmm. The kind of way of thinking about what we're all doing, and it's it's Elizabeth Bennet, and she's reading Mr. Darcy's letter again, and she's learning to read it better. Um, but it, for me, it's a moment where Jane Austen is letting us know how much you can do by reading again. Um, and uh, so, uh, so I, I find that encouraging as we all kind of have to keep doing the same things again and again, um, that uh, you, they can be widely different, the effect of a second, uh, second effort. Absolutely. Lucy, do you have one you want to offer? Do you have anything you want to add? I need to give you Jane Austen as seen through the eyes of her sister, Cassandra, yeah. that she'd been the son of my life, the soother of every sorrow, and to lose her is as if I'd lost part of myself. Wow. 
Uh, that's a perfect note for us to reflect on and bring Marissa back on. Uh, Marissa, thank you for organizing all of this. Thank you. And we'll uh, turn things back to you to, uh, to send us off. Yeah, that was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I hate to end this. This has been such a really interesting discussion. And thank you to everyone watching and for all of your um, really insightful questions about Jane Austen and for our authors. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed the celebration of Jane Austen. So please join me in a huge thank you to our wonderful moderator, Devani, and our authors, Natalie, Janice, Rachel, and Lucy. Um, just a final reminder, you can learn about all of our authors' books and order copies by visiting bit.ly slash celebration of Jane books and check out Devani at devanylozer.com. Um, so thank you all again, and we'll see you all again soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye.